So welcome to No Nonsense. And here are a couple of questions that we are going to look at today. Will China get rich and become the world's leading superpower before it gets too old and ages out? Its population is in decline and there are more deaths than births. And is Canada being just far too naive about the risks of doing business with China, with their continued interference in our democratic institutions, our elections, and our security infrastructure. David Mulroney, a former Canadian ambassador to China from 2009 to 2012, is now a distinguished senior fellow at the Monk School and serves on the Macdonald Laurier Institute Advisory Board. Uh, he looks at these issues on an, a daily, if not an hourly basis. And so uh, we'd like to plumb the depths of his mind here and see what he thinks. Just um, for full disclosure, David and I work very closely together on the special Afghanistan task force. So we know each other and you've been a guest here before and welcome. Great to see you. Great to be with you, Senator. Yeah, that's great. Um, you sent out a tweet the other day. Um, uh, referring to what Ottawa sees it is, as its priorities. This was about a mandate letter for the Minister of Procurement. They're very busy and very concerned about climate action, residential schools, LGBTQ issues, diversity, but nowhere in this letter did they talk about technology coming from China and infiltrating our military and communications systems. Uh, how worried are you actually about that? I'm I'm very worried, and I I I'm worried for reasons that have a little bit to do with Afghanistan. And, and you know, as you saw firsthand, Minister, it's not the first impulse of government departments to work seamlessly together, right? And the the whole right. reason we were in Afghanistan and and what you and your fellow panelists achieved was. Uh, a plan for working seamlessly together that that actually worked. But yeah, it took it, a lot it. of effort. And the first thing you said was the prime minister has to lead it. And the prime minister of the day agreed to do that. So China is a much bigger challenge than Afghanistan was. As important as Afghanistan was, China is a vast challenge because just about every part of the federal government has something to do with China. And nice. getting them to do that together and in an intelligent way takes a lot of work. At some point, a directive should go out saying, if this procurement has China in it, check with your boss. You know, get, <laughs> just get, get advice. And, and that's not happening. And instead of asking the person who's responsible, the minister who's responsible for procurement to do all these other things, or in addition to that, you might say, and by the way, don't make any more dumb purchasing decisions vis-a-vis -vis China. And that, that clearly hasn't happened. And if that hasn't happened, we have a problem. We we had, of course, much uh, ado about Huawei because the fate of the two Michaels was in the balance, but it did cause people to start looking a little deeper. So let me just put some of this on the record and have you react. The RCMP using Sinclair Technologies, a Chinese subsidiary for its radio communications. The federal government granted Nuketech security contracts for $7 million for 170 embassies and consulates around the world. Security cameras in our buildings and on streets are made by the Chinese. Huawei is not only in TELUS, in TELUS but in our national security institutions. And of course, the Chinese buy Canadian companies and relabel products. They have vast amounts of agricultural land, energy resources. This is a massive infiltration into our economy, uh, our country, our culture, and our livelihoods. Absolutely. And of course, we always get the answer that none of these things is a problem until six months later, they say, oops, actually, there is a backdoor technology here. So that's what I, you know, what I was trying to get at earlier, that at some point, if it's got China in it, bureaucrats yeah. should stop get some advice. So there are some things that are, are benign and should continue and will continue or in, are in Canada's interest to continue. But there are a lot of things that we're doing that we should stop. One of the things I've been thinking about and worrying about is university research. The right. universities will not discipline themselves. Money's involved, ego is involved, and they will continue to do uh, research, including with universities affiliated with the Chinese military. The Chinese military is a vast operation and it has its own universities. We're doing research with them. We should stop this. So you need leadership from the top. The prime minister's got to get involved and he's got to get 
hands-on. There's no sign of that happening, and there's no sign that it has happened, frankly. There is no sign. What What's your thought on that? I mean, we know that his father traveled China and, and, and was very um, embracing of China, said, oh, if we just simply worked with them and brought them along, we're going to create this democracy. And then there's this lifelong, you know, relationship with Norman Bethune. And I, I, I can see a young Justin Trudeau going along on those trips and hearing those stories. But we are in a very different world today. That's that's very true. And, and you know, one of the things that's happened is in the space of um, the lifetime of many people, including me, China has changed fundamentally. So when I first went out to China, even in the mid 80s, uh, Shanghai was a backward city, yeah. it was starved of investment, starved of resources. They still needed uh, Canadian assistance. They, they needed uh, you know, universities helping them. They needed municipal governments advising them, et cetera, et cetera. But China has changed dramatically from the time of uh, the senior Mr. Trudeau. But we haven't. Our thinking or the government's thinking hasn't hasn't changed. And there's still a tendency to see China through this romantic lens. Uh, and China is quite happy to cultivate that, that view. But we've got to wake up and you've got to adjust your foreign policy in light of changing circumstances. And the prime minister has been very, very slow to do that, really slow. Do you think the reluctance is just because of the way he was raised and taught uh, by the father? Is there something else? Like, it it seems a no-brainer. When I sit around and talk with family members or neighbors, you know, they're picking up goods and looking at them and say, you know, if this is made in China, I'm not buying it. Like, consumers are even on this on this issue in a much more aggressive way. To me, it, one of the, the sort of aha moments or, or what what moments was when the prime minister went to China and he was, we were still talking about having a free trade agreement with the Chinese. And he actually seemed to believe, and this is long after he became prime minister, that he could negotiate a quote unquote progressive free trade deal with the Chinese so that China would change its society to be more like Canada. And he he tried to negotiate it himself and failed. So he lost a lot of face. That, that wasn't a very smart thing to do. Right. But that he actually believed that suggests to me that he was really afflicted with a profound naivete, right? He he was very naive about China, and he he was sort of uh, pursuing the China of his dreams rather right. than the China that exists in reality. And and he can't afford to have that in a prime minister. Now he has, can, you know, he's changed. He's he's come back and said that he he understands that it, it's more complicated, but it's pretty late in the day. And the two ambassadors that he personally appointed were both both people who agreed that we should promote, build, yeah. bigger, better, more. So um, we've been on that path for way too long. Uh, I, I want to raise both of those questions because this week in Ottawa, of course, Dominic Barton, uh, the former head of McKinsey, who became our ambassador, and everyone thought, oh, what a, a brilliant move. He's lived in Asia for so long, and because he's so connected to the Chinese government, he'll be able to get the two Michaels out in a minute. Uh, didn't happen. Um, I, once again, we had to wait for the Americans to uh, to threaten, and then they released. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I think if you looked back at, at previous cases where um, people had been uh, arrested in North America for uh, spying for China, that was how they got resolved. I mean, that was, I think, always in the cards that the the Department of Justice uh, w was going to require something along those lines. But we we didn't seem to understand that. What's interesting about Mr. Barton, and I mean, he's been the, the head the head of McKinsey in his past. Um, like the prime minister, he also had a, a, a late conversion on China. He said, you know, I, I drank the Kool-Aid on the Belt and Road program, et cetera, et cetera. So he's like the prime minister. I'm not sure that that's the guy. It's, it's a bit like baseball, right? You put pitchers in for certain situations. I'm not sure that's the person you, you put in if you're trying to recalibrate and tone down your relationship with China. So it was maybe a, a managerial error in the prime minister's office. Um, but we were on that promotional road for a long time. And early in the pandemic, for example, the government's whole way of speaking about China's pandemic response was was to praise China unreservedly. And mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that you you pick 
fault, you, 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 you criticize unnecessarily, I am suggesting you should simply say, be guided by the facts and say what's true and don't suggest to Canadians that um, China is some place that somehow, you know, has defied gravity and has all the answers to COVID because clearly it didn't. And, you know, there, there were a lot of questions that remain unanswered. So oh, well, that, it, it was the host and, and why anybody, I think, and people questioned this at the time, although not really out loud because you you didn't dare. But I mean, why would we be buying vaccines from China? Why would we be buying medical equipment from China by the hundreds of millions of dollars when they were the host country where they're not the world's largest producer of that. Go to India if you want vaccine or better still build up our own industry. But but that was seemed such a bizarre move. It was a bizarre move, too, because essentially what you're doing is putting your head in the lion's mouth. You're saying yeah. we're going to make ourselves entirely dependent on a decision that you get to make, China. And that is that that's a recipe for disaster because of course china is going to hold your feet to the fire they're not our friends the whole notion that foreign policy is about friendship is it, it is with the united states i mean because it, yes, it's, that's a it's bigger case. than a foreign yeah. policy issue yeah but with other countries i mean the french and the british don't go into it saying oh could you know this, this this is our friend they think very carefully about their national interest they think about their vulnerabilities and then they act accordingly and that's really basically what we've needed in Canadian foreign policy. What are our interests in a changing world? You know, the United States is, is changing in some ways. Yeah. The world's becoming more multipolar, probably riskier for middle powers like Canada. So how do we deploy the resources that we have, the advantages that we have to best advantage, and how do we navigate in this world? And I, I, I mean, I've followed the unrolling of our new Indo-Pacific strategy. Right, right. But aside from having a list of expenditures we're going to make, I didn't see a lot of strategy there. I didn't see that sort of navigational sense that that we need. Yeah, I, I want to come back to that in a moment, but I'm just I'm interested in this notion of the friendship because it's too as as you know I I worked out of New York and it was very much appealing to that and and the president of the day always sends one of his big fundraisers and friends to Canada and and uh, those so it is about but but in these other countries those kinds of friendships actually become conflicts of interest. And I'm thinking about McKinsey and, and Dominic Barton. I mean, they were, his company was doing a lot of business in China. He, he was not in any position to get tough or pick a fight or say, you know, this is going to be over if you don't do X, Y, or Z. My impression of the, the briefings, I, I was invited once to a McKinsey briefing um, some, some time ago that it was very good on the upside of China, and there's a significant yep. upside. It's very exciting, very glossy presentation, yep. but not as strong on the, the downside and the risk. And as you know, when you're the representative, the consul general, the ambassador, you have yep. to explain the downside. It's You can't just tell Ottawa good news. It's not all happy talk. Here's our problem. This is what they don't like. This is what they're not getting. This is where the plan is going gonna, is gonna to run into trouble. And um, I, I'm not sure that we got that or would get that from from a company like McKinsey that is so closely tied to the Chinese state and that has shown, frankly, remarkably bad judgment in terms of some of the things that it's done with China. I, I just wouldn't pick them as my uh, my main external advisor on China. There are a lot of other places where uh, yeah. I get more rounded advice. There's a lot of uh, activity, certainly online, about you know their role in the oil opioid uh, industry that you know you see that almost on a daily basis and and that that is profoundly shocking and from a north american perspective um no. and i'm surprised it hasn't resonated uh, more in canada the other thing for me that I, I found shocking was the fact that um i think in late 2018 uh, they hosted their corporate retreat in xinjiang just you know kilometers away from uh, ground zero in, yep. in chinese repression who what China consultant would say that's a good idea right. to to uh, an external to a, an external government? It, how does that how does that make sense? It doesn't. So their China judgment I th appeared skewed from time to time, and it things and things like that are a, a red flag. I think because the government on the one hand was you know sending Bob Ray and other you know off on missions to worry about the the Uyghurs and and all of the human rights abuses, and then you know, doing business with someone who would make that, as you say, flawed judgment call. The, the only thing is um, that China 
wanted foreign firms to go into Xinjiang. Of they course. wanted a foreign yeah. presence to say that everything's just peachy and just fine. But th yeah. that's not exactly the advice that we need to hear. You need a consultant who will explain that and say, don't do it. You you had just raised the Indo-Pacific strategy, which I want to kind of delve into a little bit because it's been sitting there for a long time. The government showed no particular interest in it. And then it became very obvious that we were being left out of the discussions about that whole region, that we were not included in the defense, the military arrangements. Australia was at the table, but we weren't at the table. And one gets the sense that when um, Christian Friedland went to the States to give a, a quite a, a hawkish speech, that there'd somehow been a reading of the Riot Act. And, you know, you'd speculate on this, but the Americans basically saying, you know, step up and start to play ball here, or you're not going to be part of this at all. Do you think that's what happened in some form or another? I, I think that's what inevitably happens. I'm just not sure that we've understood it. I mean, if you look okay. at, at Canadian recent Canadian history, you know, since the end of the Second World War, we brought two things to the table in the late 1940s, um, uh, a significant military uh, that had made a major contribution in World War II, so a reliable ally, and people with great ideas. I mean, think of Lester Pearson, but think of that generation of people. Then by the 60s and 70s, we weren't bringing the military contribution so much anymore. Uh, but we still had the ideas. We had an uptick. I think one of the lessons of Afghanistan was the need to mm -hmm. invest in an expeditionary military. And that we got invited Absolutely. to places because we were willing yep. to do that. Because we stepped up. Yeah. But we've, we've sort of lost the thread of that. So not bringing the material, the, the expenditures, not bringing the ideas. Um, we're a neighbor. And so we get, we're part of the three amigos discussions because we have to be. Yeah. But we're not top of mind. I just sort of read when I look at lists of um, um, stories about China and, and countries reacting to China. I almost never see Canada mentioned anymore. We're yeah. we're not we're, we're just not top of mind. Um, and I think there's a cost to that. I'm not sure that the Indo-Pacific strategy, even though it's a list of expenditures and it's a lot of money, yeah. it's not the kind of money that you, that you need to make a difference in the region. To me, the two signs that we're not serious yet are one uh, our inability to really procure weapon systems effectively we've just sort of finalized the deal on the f-35 jets but we're having a real problem on on ships that's what we were talking about back in the days of afghanistan yeah. so, so that uh, that is is a significant problem the other thing is if we were really thinking about ourselves as a middle power in an increasingly multipolar challenging world We'd be getting really, really serious about the Canadian economy, saying, you know, it's 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 going to be tough, but it's easier if your economy is robust. And what card would I play? I'd play the energy card. We've had Germany and Japan knocking on our door, saying politely, uh, Germany saying, we don't want to depend on the Russians anymore. Canada, right. can you help us out? China saying, or J Japan saying, we need a reliable energy supplier for our own future. Canada, can you help? And we quickly change the subject. So instead of investing in, in infrastructure, in, in, in really ensuring that our economic future in, in, for the next decades, we can do all the other things that Prime Minister talks about. We can do hydrogen. We can think about renewables, et cetera. But let's not leave this in the ground. Let, let's think about it. That's, those are key elements of, of a strategy from a government that really means what it says. It, it's going to change things. And that, that's the problem. I mean, it's nonsensical to the rest of the world. As you say, when our allies are saying, please, you've got the uh, you've got the LNG, you've got the oil and gas, like, let's let's do this now. We're not saying the environment doesn't matter. We're just saying pause a little bit on that and play your part as an international contributor. And what you've got is energy. So put that on the table to help allies in the middle of this uh, huge fight with Russia. And as you know, being present in those ways also uh, delivers influence, right? You you have yeah. conversations with the Germans, you have conversations with the Japanese where it really matters what we think. Yeah. We're part of their thinking about the future instead of sort of forgotten. And yeah. uh, I, I think we've, we've lost a significant amount of, of, of influence. I, people still like Canada. They think I, yeah. I think you're increasingly concerned about some of the things they're reading about Canada domestically that we're a little yeah. bit 
uh, off the wall. Um, so we haven't lost that. We're just not taken seriously anymore. Yeah. And no, and I think that, that that's really true. I mean, when, when we stepped up in Afghanistan, our troops had a great reputation. We went about getting the, the equipment we needed, albeit a bit belatedly, but we did do it. And I was sitting in America listening to people say, you're a partner, you're a friend, we can count on you, you've got our back. Um, and But if you don't do that, if you're trying to find four tanks to send to Ukraine and, you know, be ripping off parts from the ones that are sitting in the field to make that happen, everybody's looking and going, four tanks? I mean, really? <laughs> and if you want to play a role in the Indo-Pacific region, right. Pacific is a big part of that. And you have to have a Navy that can do that and do the domestic roles, perform the domestic roles uh, that it must uh, perform. And we're a long way from being able to do that, too. Uh, it, it, on the energy question, it also puzzles me because, you know, we can we can ban every plastic bag we want in Canada and it's not going to make a dent in the output of the world's most massive polluter, China. Uh, they're burning coal. They're, do, you know, why would we not when we're putting a carbon tax on every farmer, when we're squeezing every small business and every trucker and putting them out of business, why would we not be putting a carbon tariff on, on the Chinese and all of the goods that come in? It's also a tremendous uh, loss, of, uh, lack of confidence in Canadian technology and in producers, yeah. for example, in Western Canada. We're not yeah. only uh, th among the cleanest now, we could, we're getting cleaner and better. And uh, I'd much rather be dealing with Canada, and I'm sure Germany and Japan would, than Russia, for example. Right. Uh, so it, there's so much, there's so so many obvious things pointing to making this decision that it's it's a real head scratcher. And I think that they're just obstinately not going to do that. But the re effect will be that we will not have the impact in the world that they profess uh, to seek. We we just won't. Well, and it also, it seems to me, limit options for future governments, be they a different version of liberal governments or a conservative, whatever it may be, um, that, that if we make these fundamental decisions, these profound de decisions that we're kind of Shut, you know, we're going to regulate oil and gas out of business. It's kind of precludes our activity on the global stage for the future as well. Absolutely, it, it does. These are these are big decisions. Um, I, I want to come back a little bit, if I can, to the uh, the question of China's behavior here. Uh, and we talked about, we started out on the uh, the procurement issue. But the other thing that's been sitting out there and media reports and acknowledgements by the uh, security establishment in some way that, that China is um, targeting the Canadian democratic system, reports of 11, 11 federal ridings targeted by the Chinese in 2019. I'm assuming that was the case in 21 as well. Um, and that election meddling might just be kind of the tip of the iceberg in a in a vast campaign of foreign interference. This is the biggest um, unreported story or partially reported story. I mean, Global exactly. News has done yeah. a, a remarkable job. The Globe is is covering uh, this uh, as well, uh, but it's not yet. Yeah, I think the Prime Minister has succeeded in in, in sort of shutting it down uh, for yeah. for uh, at least for a time, and. Here's the thing. China's, as a state, has a doctrine that says we, we're, we and and has a, a, a part of its government whose role is, is to influence foreign countries, uh, to eliminate uh, threats to the Communist Party, uh, and also to, to bolster its aims and objectives. So that's it's part of its doctrine. Allies like the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand have all faced similar, are, are facing right. similar right. problems. We're hearing reports from Canadians of Han Chinese, Tibetan, and Uyghur origin that they are being muscled and intimidated here in Canada. We're reading reports about Chinese, quote unquote, police stations in Canada. And now I think very frustrated intelligence officers are desperately trying to get the story out. And yeah. I listened to some of the testimony um, in the, the procedures committee from our the, the 
bureaucratic guardians of our uh, elections, uh, the integrity of our elections. And, and they're, they're impressive and they're hardworking people. But it reminded me a little bit of the the Maginot Line in France. You know, the 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 great defenses that France France built before World War II that was going to keep out the German war machine. And right. it was very impressive, but it was very easily uh, circumvented and and yeah. France fell. And so I think we have this kind of Maginot line of election defenses that protect against everything except the main tools that China uses. And what's one of the main tools that it uses? It's proxies. So no, China, the, the embassy doesn't cut a check for uh, some uh, person in a, in a writing office somewhere, but they'll get someone who will, or they'll get enough people so it doesn't set off any bells or whistles, but uh, 10,000 or 20,000 or 50,000 sure gets interest in an election campaign. They right. have done it in other places. I think they're doing it here. And I think there are two things that, that China seeks. Um, one, it, it, it seeks to have Canada look over its shoulder to make sure that nothing we say or do, the government says or does, uh, it runs counter to China's objectives. And right. so we're, we're, you know, we're, we're looking here, we're watching. The other thing it does is it expects us to look away when it interferes in diaspora communities and uh, and and becomes almost um, a, a separate system of government. And in, in, it yeah. provides policing. Uh, it uh, provides um, more than consular advice. It comes and gives you a phone call if there's something um, something problematic you're doing and maybe tells you that your relatives could be in some jeopardy if you don't stop. It's intrusive. It's coercive, and I'll, some of the folks in, in particular Tibetan and Uyghur communities are saying Canadian police aren't helping. They, 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 they don't see the problem with having Chinese police do this. As you know, in our embassies abroad, we have police liaison, but they yes. don't have police in other jurisdictions. Yeah. They talk to the police in other jurisdictions. Exactly. Chinese uh, authorities are going way beyond that, and we we cannot let that happen because then what happens? We've seen already um, suspicions, and I think they're incredible, that China has been uh, propagating the falsehood that simply worrying, simply talking about this or t taking steps to counter it is anti-Chinese, is racist. Right. And everything falls into that category. It's the same reason we couldn't say anything about the virus or the vaccines not working. It would be considered racist. And of course, you have to approach it carefully. You have to think about it sensitively. Yeah. Um, but Again, the objective of the United Front Work Department, which is this part of the Communist Party of China, is to infiltrate diaspora communities. And of course, the first thing it's going to say is there's nothing here to see. And, and if you think there is, it's racist. And I think the really pernicious part of this is that fear stays in the minds of politicians, right? Yeah. You don't need that. It also stays in the mind of journalists because the other part of the allegation that Global News brought up was that the this is getting very sophisticated, but the concerts were going to companies that are based in a particular riding and have operations in China. And they're saying, your operation in China could be in some jeopardy if this MP of yours votes along these lines. Uh, and that gets the attention of companies that actually support and, and, right. and maybe help to um, you know, they, they contribute to various uh, various candidates. So it is, I think it's a real thing. I think it's something we should worry about. Um, yeah. But we seem to be tiptoeing around it. The prime minister's own language was very carefully parsed. It reminded me, and, and, and this is a little uh, salty, but uh, of uh, Bill Clinton saying, I did not have... Yeah, a sense of that woman. woman. Yeah. We get it. But, you know, so when the, the prime minister said, I, we, we didn't hear anything about the consulate um, depositing right. money. Okay, technically yes, but something else is is happening. And well, that's what's not money. credible when we hear the prime minister and government ministers saying, "We don't know what writings this they're talking about. We don't know which eleven. We don't know about these police forces, uh, quote unquote, sort of operating through fear and intimidation." Of course, they would know the answer to that if they asked it of our own security officials. One of the things that I've been very interested in um, is this Australian foreign interference registry that they yeah. have. Yeah. And so the way it works is um, it, it goes beyond lobbying. 
And what they're saying is if a, a Canadian citizen or someone in Canada is um, is lobbying, is speaking on behalf of, or is uh, dispersing money on behalf of a foreign entity, an entity controlled by a foreign government, they have to be transparent about it. They're not saying yeah. you can't do it. They're simply saying you have to be transparent about it. Yeah. And they have even higher um, recommendations for uh, former uh, public office holders, former elected officials, and former public servants. And they actually have a registry now, and you can go and you can see who's on that registry. And the government, it has some teeth because the, the intelligence agencies in Australia can can determine that uh, uh, an entity is actually acting on behalf of a foreign state. And, and is not and, registered. And, and can compel yeah. uh, that, that degree of transparency. Just a rumor that that was coming, and 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 uh, an MP called Kenny Chu had had introduced legislation to that effect. Uh, I, I think cost him his seat because of the the blowback, and it seems to have been an orchestrated blowback campaign. But what that would do was eliminate this this proxyism, which is present in in Canadian politics. It's present on universities where there are entities that are working for the Chinese state. I mean. I saw vestiges of it uh, long ago when uh, Chinese leaders would come to Canada and suddenly all of a sudden there'd be like 300 people show up all with the same little Chinese flag, all with the same T-shirts. And, and they, they, they'd be university kids, uh, you know, coming from McGill to Ottawa and they'd say, oh, yeah, right. we got 30 bucks for our per diem and here, here's our flag and here's a, And he right. said, expect us back on the bus. And at one point, uh, the Chinese ambassador, uh, I used to have to stay up. Uh, through the night while the protests were going on, a Chinese ambassador came into the hotel lobby and said, David, uh, there are protesters and they're keeping the president awake. So I went out and I said, oh, ambassador, they're your protesters. So maybe <laughs> <laughs> not not Canadian protesters. Yeah, so, not right? anything I can do. <laughs> he was a little embarrassed. But um, that ability to orchestrate a protest, there right. are allegations that some of the um, Meng Wanzhou, the, the protests to have her freed, may have been a little bit stage managed. Orchestrated as well. No, and, and we've seen it just, you know, recently in Ottawa, where if the ambassador goes to give a speech on a campus, the campus participates in restricting media coverage or access. Like this is, these yeah, are institutions. That was shocking. That yeah. was shocking that they, and they pulled the blinds down so people couldn't yes. see pictures. Yeah. So it's bad enough that China does it. It's it's worse when Canadian institutions that have, have, should have some backbone Actually, yeah. I, I, I've also felt that, not that I, we should be discourteous to, to foreign uh, diplomats, but boy, they kept me under control in China. I was kept on a tight leash. And if they, for example, exactly. heard that the Dalai Lama was coming to Canada, I would get a call. And as you know, when the one thing that a foreign ministry can do is they can call in the ambassador and the ambassador right. has to go. Right. So... In Canada, when we'd call in ambassadors, we do it in office hours and we're sort of decent about it. The Chinese would call me in on Saturday night at like nine o'clock. I'd come into the darkened foreign ministry and I'd be told I'd be ushered into a, an, an even darker room where I'd sit for yeah. like an hour. And then I'd get brought into a room with bright lights and about 12 people all yelling at me about the Dalai Lama. And the idea was to kind of get into my head and, and rattle me, right? right. We, I, I think, treat the ambassador with exquisite courtesy i wish we didn't see quite as many canadian groups particularly business groups across the country giving him a privileged platform and a, a microphone and a chance to you know enough is enough this yeah. we're getting propaganda here tone it yeah tone it down but it, our, our canada friendship associations yeah. are one thing but honestly we have to be a little bit more grown up about it and, and this was happening when the the two michaels were were being yes killed. yes it, so our Canadian courtesy sometimes is a little bit over the top. Yeah. And either naive, I guess almost naive is the best case scenario, uh, being, um, you know, our policy of accommodation is even is much more troubling that we're actually doing this deliberately and through choice, you know, yeah. that we yeah. want to, uh, I want to ask you about, uh, about protests because we have been seeing some, I mean, President Xi is, Everyone says, you know, the most powerful leader since Mao and all of this. Um, and with these severe lockdowns that he imposed, sort of second round in COVID, 
people finally fought back. Um, do you think it it was in response to that, to the protest, to public sentiment, or do you think he just simply used that as an excuse to shut down what was getting too problematic on many scores? That, that's the $64,000 question, because the, the Chinese reversal on COVID was incredible. Yeah. No, and, but unfortunately, and it spinning. was so it was so uh, last minute that yeah. there was none of the preparations done for okay and now what what else what what are we yeah. doing yeah. We and i think you know china was heading to a, an even larger crisis they they had shut things down so severely that the economy which was already taking a hit from xi himself clamping down on technology firms punishing ceos taking yeah. the gas out of a, a an out of control housing sector but zero covid which was shutting down entire cities and and playing havoc with with um you know uh, supply chains and things zero covid was going to be the finish them off so they had to do something and i either she completely changed his personality and and <laughs> said no or finally some people around him got some backbone and said we you you you're pushing this too far yeah having shown so full marks for him for getting off that disastrous course but once you've shown that degree of weakness that you will you, you won't go to the wall every time it, it's it's the, the way forward is going to be much more more interesting so yes the economy is now uh coming back and it's it's you know markets love it um those companies that left china having been burned I don't think they're coming back because right. if I burn you badly and then say, yep. I, Senator, I, my bad, you know, yep. uh, you may say, David, I forgive you, but you're probably not going to trust me uh, the way you did before. Yep. Uh, and and companies that lost their own money are are, are going to remember that uh, a long time. And the technology sector in particular is feeling pretty badly burned because it's not just getting shut down. It's getting sent away somewhere. Yeah. So. Um, a, lot of people, a lot of people are, are voting voting with their feet. The other thing, of course, the, the other news, and it's, you know, from she having the Olympics and extending his term and being, you know, on top of everything, he's had a pretty rough, you know, winter. The other news, of course, is is this uh, decline in, in China's yeah. uh, birthday. And that's been coming for some time, has a lot to do with the one child family policy which was imposed in draconian ways in the in the hinterland but and everybody also, kept the boy but not the girl and it was kind of hard to procreate <laughs> exactly and 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 what happens too is you know beijing says one thing but by the time that policy gets out to the because think of, of china as as europe right yeah. so if brussels says something by the time it gets to uh bulgaria or to southern greece maybe the message is a little bit distorted and the right. local people and you know they they act with much more zeal right they're going to be the yeah. toughest people so it, yeah for sure people suffered greatly because of that um but the other thing that's happening is that china got more prosperous uh people don't have as many kids when they're more prosperous okay. and it's really really expensive to raise a child in china if yeah. you want to get them into a top university and you don't come from beijing or shanghai you're out of luck right you you yeah. You've got to pay for expensive tutors. You've got to come home from work and do tutoring yourself. It's it's murder. And so some people are saying, we don't need this. We don't need this. At most, we're going to have one kid and maybe not even that. There, there's a phenomenon in China right now they call lying flat. And basically it's saying is I'm opting out, right? I'm not going to kill myself. This rat race that I've been on, when the economy was booming, I, I get it because then I can buy a car yeah. and I can get married. I mean, in China... Now, um, because of the gender imbalance, when online uh, young men ask young women uh, out for dates, there's a quite a list of things I'd like to know. You know your finances. You know how much do you make? Do you have a car? Do you have a driver's license? Do you have a car? How tall are you? And it's it's already difficult to to date. And and so Chinese society is going is is working. Yeah, I mean we're seeing that problems. in the Western world where young men have to kind of get permission to, you know, date and how much touching will there be and this and that. Like we're getting into some bizarre world, but there it would be. It, it's more complicated still. And and, and yeah. so here's the other thing that's happening. Psychologically, 
although China had a, a population problem, being the biggest meant something. Who's yeah. number? Who, who's going to be number one very soon? India. Yeah. And China has always belittled India, and they've looked down on India and said, look right. at our miracle, look at how backward India is. Suddenly, India is this vigorous, dynamic country that people are taking a second look at, and you know they're they're cultivating, and they're bigger than China. So that's not a great thing if you're Xi Jinping to have on your, you know, while you're in office. It was going to happen anyway, but it's going to be um, another blow to uh, China's prestige. It's a strange way of looking at it, but I, I think yeah. it's very true. We're not the biggest enemy. I was reading about the this Belt and Road project of of China's, and they're putting a lot of money in, you know, also almost like a predator nation, using the money to bribe nations that are poor that need help. They are literally uh, building infrastructure and roads. And the question that was posed was really, is this just a um, you know, a, a nation using its money to do this to widen its sphere, or is it just a an illiberal nation willing to violate a lot of norms because they're actually more pro elite rather than anti democratic. That they're just that snobbery almost that you were talking about. Yeah, Belt and Road. One of the problems that they're facing with Belt and Road now is zero COVID cost so much right. that people right. are running out of money. You, you were tested like three times a day. If you're testing 1.3 yeah. billion people, just the amount of money governments were spending on testing is is right. incredible. So. Some of the gas is running out of that. It's also getting um, bad press in Africa and South Asia, in in Pakistan, for example, because the Chinese way of doing it is to have Chinese people do it. And so Chinese workers come, uh, they take over everything, uh, they build it relatively quickly, but it doesn't help in, in terms of employment. It doesn't show yeah. much respect. So I think that is is overstretched, and I think. I think it's a product of the idea that was that's been very much central to Xi Jinping's thinking, and it's been around for about ten years. That America is finished, and sooner than Australia, than China thought, and now is the time for China to get really aggressive and seize that number one spot. And one way to do it is to be absolutely seamlessly connected with Europe, with markets in the West through the. There's a polar dimension to this, which we should be thinking about. There's a uh, uh, land yes, they're corridor. They're up north. They are there. <laughs> and so um, this was China's statement, right? Where yeah. This goes with being number one. But they got the timing off, right? Because America isn't finished. America is not a spent force. And right. this is costing more than China thought. And they're dealing with a lot of governments that are now pushing back, particularly. I mean, they were called, they were trying to get into the Baltics. They, uh, I was in... Greece uh, a few months ago, and and remembering that the port of Piraeus now is owned by the Chinese, that that's a significant thing. Um, they've got sig significant investments in Sri Lanka, but all of these things are, are are problematic. They've got to deal with local politics. They've got to deal with local politicians, uh, and they've got to deal with um, local workers. So I, I think Belt and Road is becoming an increasingly heavy burden for the Chinese to to, to bear, but it's based on that. That vision that isn't coming true that the the u s the the crown is is available. It's not I, I've used so much of your time already, but I can't end this conversation without saying the word and having you respond, Taiwan. <laughs> ah. well, um taiwan, I, I I spent three years in Taiwan, and I, yep. and I was there when the Guomindang, the old National Party, lost to the Democratic Progressive Party. People who actually lived on the island, speak Taiwanese, love their home, and don't think of themselves as Chinese. As Chinese, and right. The reality is that now m more people think that way on Taiwan than think the other way. And the only reason they don't say it out loud is because China will go to war with them. Yeah. The Pelosi visit was a, a significant step, and China was embarrassed and they reacted. But the reality was Xi Jinping had already upped the ante, right? He was already taking aggressive moves. These sorties by Chinese aircraft, fighters and bombers, right. were testing Taiwan's air defenses and wearing them down. So China had already started this, whether Nancy Pelosi went there or not. Went or not. Yeah, I agree. And I think you're going to see uh, countries that are, are bolder. Unfortunately, Canada has not been among them. The last ministerial trip was actually while I was there. A, a week after <laughs> I arrived, John Manley <laughs> again oh um, showed up as, as industry minister. Uh, and then we didn't have ministerial visits after that. The reality is we can have, that's completely uh, acceptable under our policy, uh, as long as you're you know careful and thoughtful. 
Do I think Xi Jinping feels pressure to attack Taiwan? He certainly does. But I think he's also looked at Ukraine and in a country that the Russians could drive to, uh, they're facing tremendous problems. You don't, uh, Taiwan's a hundred miles uh, away from, from uh, China. Just the effort of building an invasion force would be apparent to intelligence, to US intelligence, to Taiwanese intelligence for a long time. It's a very difficult thing to do. They can certainly cause pain for people in Taiwan and they, they may try to do that. The safest, best thing is that we maintain the status quo until China changes. And I'd like to say, you know, I mean, you may say, well, that's going to be a long time. It is. And it, it breaks my heart. But that's this difficult position we're in. We, Canada, should be doing much more with Taiwan to show that it's not just a Sino-China-Taiwan issue. Other countries have a real stake there and respect it. Even uh, rhetorically. Even rhetorically, and and we we still are kind of in the default uh, hyper hyper cautious mode. Um, I see that Taiwan's opening an office in Montreal, which is a good thing. Uh, and Taiwan, I I think the, the advice I've had for Taiwanese friends is think a little bit more of about Canada as Canada rather than as a mini U.S. Yes. We're not going to have a Taiwan Relations Act. We we're not going to do things the way the Americans do them for a whole bunch of reasons. There are areas where we're different, but cultivate Canadian friends get you know build projects in canada and and support will will come with it although i'm i, I think I, I, when you have a government that's default yeah. position is pretty pro china that that may be some time it's coming it's going to be difficult david uh thank you so much uh i know this stuff is in your head i follow you almost on a daily basis you're thinking about this constantly and thank you for thinking about it uh so deeply and thank you for your time to share it today well, it's always a pleasure to talk, Senator. Take care. Oh, it's just wonderful. David Mulroney, he was our ambassador in China, 2009-2012, but now thinks great thoughts at the Monk School and the McDonald Laurier Institute and helps us educate ourselves about what's going on. So thanks again, David, and thanks for all of you for watching. That is it for No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen for this week. Thanks. Thank you. So thanks for being part of the No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen audience. We really appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind, give us a review or a like or a thumbs up. It helps us uh, promote our podcast and make sure that more people can hear it. And it also helps us figure out what, what topics you like to hear about. And then uh, we can focus on that. So we'd really appreciate it here at No Nonsense.